Now in this week's workshop and labs, we're going to be talking about direct current DC circuits. Now this is something that most of you should have done at school. However, we find that in practice, a lot of people have conceptual problems with it. Research suggests that there can be people who can totally do the mathematics, but have no conceptual understanding and vice versa. In this class, we tend to find that people are okay just plugging things into equations, but don't really understand what's going on. Now, as I've said many times in this course before, if you don't know what's going on, no amount of maths will save you. So we're going to focus on the concepts, having a gut feeling of, if I cut this, will the bulb get brighter or fainter? If I wanted to increase the voltage over here, what will I do? Do I need a thicker wire? You need a gut feeling about that to guide the mathematics. Now, we're going to start off by focusing on three misconceptions that the research shows that many people have about circuits. Misconceptions are common sense understandings of something which are very hard to budge. Often people have the maths they put down and their common sense understanding the two never touch. And for circuits this is particularly bad because a common sense understanding of what voltage and current and batteries do can be very damaging when you try to actually calculate something. Most misconceptions come about from not really understanding what batteries or voltage sources do. A most common misconception is the gut feeling that what batteries do is push current around circuits, which is kind of true like most misconceptions. The idea might be that the wires are like a water pipe and that the battery is pushing water around. Now, like current round. Now, is that really true? Well, it's kind of true, but really batteries are voltage sources. They increase the potential here. They may not push any flow at all, depending on what is in the rest of the circuit. A common misconception is the idea, for example, that when you connect a battery, the current starts flowing and goes around in turn. So it might reach here before it reaches here before it reaches here. For example, if you had a circuit like this, uh, battery, switch, I don't know, say a light bulb. And then let's say a variable resistor. So a resistor you can turn up or down. People will often think that the current flows around here when the switch is closed, and then it gets to the variable resistor. So if you change the resistance here, that might mean you get less current coming out or more current coming out, but they think it will have no effect on what's going on here, because it's downstream. If this is a river, you're probably right. What you do downstream doesn't affect what happens upstream, but that is absolutely not the case for circuits. Let me show you a simulation. Here is a simple circuit with a battery, a switch, and a bulb. And now in the simulation, we can see where the electrons are happening. If we close the switch, I notice, of course, that the flow of electrons actually goes in the opposite direction to the current. But what you can see is that the electrons everywhere around the circuit start moving at the same time. They don't start at one end and start flowing around, they all start moving at the same time because they're being driven by an electric field. We can change the simulation to look at current instead. So here we're going to look at conventional current. And what again you can see, once you close the switch, everything happens at the same time. Another way this misconception often shows up is when you consider having two batteries in parallel. Now, if you think the batteries are like pumps forcing current through, you think that when you close the switch here, you're going to get a current through here and a current through, you're going to get a bigger current, so this bulb will get much brighter. In fact, for ideal circuit components, closing the second switch will make no difference to the brightness at all. Why? Because what batteries actually do is just mean that the voltage at one side is higher than the voltage at the other. They don't drive current. If you have a battery connected to nothing, just two bits of air, the voltage will still be higher here than here, but no current will flow it at all. I kind of like to think of it as moving water up to a height. So all this does is it means that the water on this side is higher than the water on that side, so it has more potential energy. But nonetheless, if that water pipe at the top has a blocked off at the end, and the one at the bottom is blocked off, then nothing will flow. This is just higher water, higher voltage than this side. So what's happening here is it's increasing the potential energy, the voltage of this side of the circuit, 
and connecting your second one it has no extra effect because the difference between the voltage here and here is the same as that between there and there. So all they do is they change the voltage, the potential of different parts of the wire, and it's that voltage that drives the current through here. Now two batteries will still be useful because if half the current flows through each of them that means this bulb might last twice as long, but it won't burn any brighter. And this is for ideal uh, batteries. Real ones have a little bit of internal resistance, and so having two of them means that internal resistance is less by having resistance in parallel. But for ideal things, having two together makes no difference. And now on to question three. This is a ninja physics question. There is a proposal, which is at least partially funded and underway, to supply power to Singapore from Australian solar electricity. At the moment, apparently Singapore mostly gets its electricity from natural gas, which is both bad for the environment, though less so than coal, and uh, gives, r makes Singapore rely on often unstable governments. So the idea is to supply maybe about a quarter of Singapore's power from Australia, have whopping great solar array at Tennant Creek in the Northern Territory, and an undersea cable so the power station will be somewhere around here, Tennant Creek, in a very sunny, flat area of very low land values. Then there will be a cable going up to, uh, to the northern coast of Australia and an undersea cable running all the way to Singapore to supply it its power. There will also be a large number of batteries and storage because the uh, time when there's sunshine here will probably doesn't match the evening peak power demand in Singapore. Anyway, this is going ahead as far as we can tell. Um, when I first read about this, I thought, this seems crazy. Can you really shift enough power to power a whole city down an undersea cable? Won't that you know, melt with the amount of power or have to be so thick that you'd cost a fortune to have thousands of kilometres of copper? Because copper is pretty expensive at the moment. So that's what you're going to try and work out. How expensive, or not how expensive, how thick the copper wire would need to be to ship the power over th three... 4,000 kilometers from Australia to Singapore. Now we could work this out using conductivity and resistivity and I'm sure you can find equations for that on the web but there is an easier way to work it out which doesn't require you to look up any of those things which is to scale from something we can measure. So in this case I'd want you to work out the power loss by scaling from this. This is 100 meters of wire and the wire is copper with a diameter of one millimeter. And I can get my multimeter and connect it across the two ends of this wire, and the resistance turns out to be about two ohms. So 100 meters copper, one millimeter diameter wire, 100 meters long, resistance of about two ohms. And that's all you need to work everything out. You can scale from that. Now for questions four and five, these are conceptual questions. They're designed to see if you have and can overcome the misconceptions that I talked about a little while ago in the video. So for these things, don't just jump to conclusions. You need to think systematically through modeling the whole circuit. So you should draw all the diagrams. Where is the current? Is there a current flowing? Make sure that the current in and out of any junction is the same. And in particular, think very hard about the voltages that go around the circuits. And if you approach it that way, thinking very hard about the modelling of the whole situation, then the answer should be very straightforward. Then we get on to the last question, and this is a more mathematical one. Sorry, someone's banging over the roof here. Where we are going to work on modelling mathematically using Kirchhoff's laws a circuit. And hopefully you've seen how to do this in the video notes. Basically, you have to use two laws. Make sure that the current into and out of every junction is the same. You don't have current mysteriously appearing and disappearing. And secondly, around any loop, making sure that all the voltages sum to zero. So the first step, once again, is to model things very carefully. If you do that correctly, you've got a really good modeling conceptual sense, then the maths is just simultaneous equations. For the extension question, it is indeed simultaneous equations, but they are so nasty, you're probably going to want to use computer algebra to solve them.